Good evening, my dear friends, and welcome. And welcome to Sister Sue and Sister Miriam who've joined us for this very special vigil celebrating Palm Sunday. But first, let us just be still and come into our hearts and just find the Christ center within you. And as you do, let us just take a nice deep in breath. And as we do, we breathe in the love of Christ. And in our out breath, we say, thank you, Jesus. In our next in breaths, we breathe in the love of God. And in our out breaths, we say, thank you, Father, Mother, God, for allowing your son endure this for me. And just relax. And be still in the presence of love. A selfless love. A reverent healing love. And be aware that those of us who are here are here because Palm Sunday is a turning point for each one of us. It's where we join Jesus in procession, singing the great Hosanna, Hosanna to the King of David, Hosanna to the Prince of Peace. And as we wave our palm branches, we are mindful, we are mindful that yes, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, but that he has to go through a horrendous ordeal in the coming days so that you and I can be free and on Easter Sunday arise with him in our heart, in our life, and in how we express our love to ourselves to one another and to God. So just let us focus now on this amazing event of Palm Sunday. And within the crowd, there are two groups of people, those who are excited about the Christ, the Son of God, the King of David, coming in procession on a donkey to Jerusalem, and there are others who are not impressed and who want to see this threat to their comfort zone destroyed. So which camp are we in? Only you can answer that. But feel the love of Christ crossing the internet and the airways and coming to you right now, wherever you may be in the world. For some, already today is Palm Sunday, as it is with Sister Miriam in Dunedin in New Zealand. But for those of us in Europe, we've got several more hours to wait but the spirit of the celebration is by far more important. So let us just come and embrace who we are as a disciple of love, a child of God. And though our faith is shaken and though our faith is tested, we are strong because we have one who went before us, who 
is our perfect role model. And that is the barefoot Galilean, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. Our first reflection this evening comes from W. H. Vanstone, who was a canon residentiary of Chester Cathedral and a member of the Doctrine Commission of the Church of England. His book, Love's Endeavour, Love's Expense, won the Collins Religious Book Prize in 1979. His other book, include Farewell in Christ and the Stature of Waiting from which the following extract is taken. And the theme is handed over. When a Christian believer is going through any distressing or disquieting experience it can be a source of comfort and encouragement to him to remember that the Lord Jesus knows all about it, that he himself went through the very same experience. So when such a person is severely tempted, he may be helped by the remembrance that Jesus also was tempted. And when he is let down or deserted by friends, he may be consoled by the thought that the same thing happened to Jesus. It is especially in the experience of acute physical pain that believers and perhaps some who are not formally believers find strength and courage. They find this strength and courage in the thought that Jesus went through the same experience, in the thought of the nails and the thorns and the pain that he must have experienced on the cross. That Jesus went through pain is a continual source of comfort and courage to pain-stricken people. It may be that the thought of the handing over of Jesus, of his transition from action to passion, can be of practical help to people who must face or already have faced a similar transition in their own lives. The word passion does not mean exclusively or even primarily pain. It means dependence, exposure, waiting, being no longer in control of one's own situation, being the object of what is done. So the passion of Jesus connects not simply or even primarily with the human experience of pain. It connects with every experience of passing suddenly or gradually into a more dependent place or phase or area of life, with going into hospital, with retiring, <clears throat> excuse me, with retiring or losing one's own job, or having to wait upon the actions of other people and other factors beyond one's control. If the thought of the passion of Jesus is helpful at all, then it may be helpful not only to the person who is bearing the cross of pain, but also to the person who feels that he is on the sidelines, that he has become useless or ineffective, 
but he is no longer making his mark on the world or his contribution to it. To be handed over in ways such as these in particularly disquieting to a person who by habit or temperament has been exceptionally active or energetic or a noble or notable achiever and such a person may well find comfort in the thought that a similar pattern appears in the life of Jesus, that he is also passed from activity and work and achievement into a final phase of waiting and dependence and passion. The fact that Jesus passed into passion will not in itself be an adequate basis for a positive understanding and a willing acceptance of our own experience of passion. But such understanding, such acceptance might emerge from consideration of the reason for which and in the manner in which Jesus passed into passion. It might emerge from recognizing that according to the gospel story, the transition which Jesus made was no mere misfortune, but rather a kind of triumph, no diminution of himself or his calling, but rather a kind of elevation if a man should be guided by the Gospels to see such worth and quality in the transition which Jesus made, then, and perhaps only then, he may have a possibility of seeing his own transition in a new and more favourable light. Powerful words but poignant. We're given a scripture reading to reflect upon, and it's from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, verses 39 to 53. That's St. Luke 22, verses 39 to 53. Yet not my will, but yours be done yet not my will, but yours be done. <clears throat> I want to stay with that. And let us just focus in our quiet time together before the Master, before the Lord, the King of Kings. And I want you to imagine you're in the crowd and you can hear in the distance a roar of singing and musical instruments being played. Just imagine a country lane, narrow, very narrow, and can only take a single line of people on either side. And you see in the distance a crowd of men and women coming in procession, waving large branches, palm branches. The sign of a king is coming and they are singing Hosanna to the King of David, Hosanna to the Prince of Peace. And as they pass you, you see a young man sat on a donkey, not in a chariot of gold, but on a donkey. A beast of burden, but that beast of burden was given an enormous 
gift from Jesus, in that on the shape of every donkey's back, there is the shape of the cross in its fur. And we believe that this was a mark of respect to the animal kingdom, to the donkey by Jesus, a sign that they are not a creature of burden, but an animal that bore the Christ at the beginning of the greatest love story ever told. And you are there in that crowd and you can see Jesus on the donkey and he's smiling you can see the apostles, Peter and Paul, James and John, Jude and Judas. You can see all of the disciples. You even can see the Mary of Magdala, Mary the wife of Cleophas, but not Mary the mother of Jesus, for she is somewhere else. And there are children running in great joy, barefoot, and the atmosphere is electric, and they're making their way through the narrow streets to Jerusalem, and you are an active participant, but the donkey stops by you. Suddenly the donkey decides to stop. And everyone is looking at you. Yes, visualize that. They're looking directly at you, the child of God. And Jesus dismounts from the donkey. And one of the disciples takes the reins of the donkey to ensure it stays still. And Jesus walks to you. He comes over to you and he embraces you. He lifts out his hands and he places them one either side of your head in a gentle, tender embrace of love. And he bends down to show his affection of you. And you look into his eyes and there you see the Christ, the Son of God who is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he has come to you. And he holds you in an embrace of love. And you are totally transfixed by the gentleness and the love that Jesus is showing to you who are here. He not only called you by name to come and follow him, he not only assured you from the moment you were born that life would be a struggle and that you would meet obstacles, trials and temptations. But you knew in your heart that he would be beside you and that he would provide for you the love that you would need with the strength and the support to overcome that transition to the passion. And now he kisses you 
the top of your head and you feel his love flowing into you. And he says to you the words mentioned in Luke's Gospel, yet not my will but yours be done. And he says, you are here out of love and I will reward that love. But there are many here who say they love me. There are many here who say they will follow me. But they will walk away. They will walk away. Because they will be ashamed of me. Because I did not bring them the riches and the gold that many had a preconceived idea of. Yes, many give lip service to me. And their hearts are closed. And those who are guilty of this are in high places of office. And they like to be seen in the best garments and vestments and command authority and abuse their position of trust given to them by me and by my Father, Mother God, where they hold the children of God in bondage, in slavery to fear. But I set you free. I do not wish for you to live in fear of me. I ask you to relinquish fear and just embrace me in love. For love is the key that will unlock the mystery and allow you to see the portal to heaven. And as he leaves you, he bids farewell. But he asks you not to run away, but he cannot force you to stay. He's inviting you to stay with him through the coming dark days when the going will be tough for Jesus and for his followers. And as he mounts the donkey, he blesses you and says farewell. And you follow him. You join the crowd and you follow him singing the great Hosanna. And you sing it with such gusto. And every muscle in your throat is aching with joy for you have been touched by the Christ and he has invited you to stay with him to comfort him in the days ahead and in the distance you see the gates of Jerusalem the old city it's another day away, but you are meandering slowly through the hills and the villages and the palms and the singing and the rejoicing and the music is so touching. But in a distance you can see a group of men finely dressed who are the Pharisees and the Sadducees disapproving of this procession of joy. And at first you feel uncomfortable that you will be summoned by them and then an inner voice. 
speaks to your heart. Whom do you fear? Whom do you love? And only you can answer that. For years, many Christians have lived in fear of God through negative theology, where it was rammed down their throat that they were evil and sinful and needed to win God's approval. And that is not so. And in our vigil last evening, <clears throat> excuse me, we talked about Jesus sharing with us about the Father, Mother, God meeting us in love and releasing us from all that fear and negativity created by our super ego. But now, you are walking behind the beloved, for he is the King of Kings. And we celebrate this. And we are not ashamed to proclaim to the world that Jesus not only is the Son of God, but he is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And it is he who has won our heart. It is he who owns our heart. Be still now. Be still in the presence of God and allow the Spirit of God prepare you to celebrate this coming Holy Week where your heart will be transformed and that on Easter morn your heart will experience a resurrection, a transference of Christ's glory and love will permeate every fibre of your being. But first, we have to take it one step at a time and walk with the Master out of love, not fear. So let us celebrate his kingship by not offering lip service, but by being a true disciple and by staying alert to that inner voice of spirit and honor what he says to us and act upon it in love. And our closing prayer God of compassion, you heal the broken in spirit and give hope to the distressed. We commend ourselves to your love and join the company of those who raise a song of thanksgiving to your glory, O Father, Mother, God, through the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And now we quietly take our leave and we wish you a happy feast day on this glorious Palm Sunday where the Christ enters Jerusalem as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and you are with him because he called you by name and because he dismounted from the donkey to touch your heart, to give you courage for the days ahead in your pilgrim journey 
as a follower of Christ. Be still now and reclaim your divinity as a child of God, a child who is loved, a child who is honored before the Father Mother God and found worthy to be a beloved of Christ. Go in peace to love and to serve your God. Namaste, Shalom, Inshallah, Paxet Bonum, Om Shanti, Solo di Carita, Salam Alaikum, and may the peace of this precious feast of Palm Sunday resonate with your heart. God bless you wherever you are in the world. I wish you peace. I wish you joy. Amen. God bless you. Praise your holy name, Lord Christ. We praise you.